Hello everyone and thanks for joining me for the latest in my People in Property series where I wanted to discuss the impact on renters if, as is being reported, a large number of private landlords sell off their investment properties. It's a topic that um, we visited before and we received a massive amount of feedback from you off the back of it. So I wanted to try and address your concerns and comments as far as possible uh, and also look at where things are at now compared to when I did that, which was about a year ago. To share some insight and expertise on the topic, I am joined today uh, by Vanessa Warwick, property investor and co-founder of Property Tribes, and also Timothy Douglas, who's head of policy and campaigns at Property Mark. Tim, Vanessa, great to see you both today. Thank you for joining me. Really, really welcome your, your thoughts, because it's a rich topic. It really is, and it's a very relevant topic at the moment. There's so much to discuss so much to chat about. Vanessa, could we just start? There there are a lot of different types of landlords in in the country Mm -hmm. at the moment. Those, the big ones with kind of 30 plus that are turning their their operations into, you know, commercial entities, businesses, companies. And then there's also lots of accidental landlords, Mm -hmm. aren't there? So it's a kind of broad, a, a broad church. But given there are so many regulations now, I think I read some, there's over 130 different regulations that they all, every landlord, it's needs to It's now up to, to 168, oh, I God, think. It just, <laughs> they're falling from the sky. So it's, it's not some, you know, it's understandable, but that people are leaving. I think it's more to do with the incredibly challenging environment that landlords are facing. And when you and I spoke about a year ago yeah. or so, Phil, which really did spark a huge online debate, which mm. actually I thought was very healthy and robust, the comments that came in. Um, I read a lot of them and found them you know, very interesting. I think the thing is that the situation for landlords has got even more challenging since then. Um, Clearly we've had the interest rate rises where the Bank of England base rate has been jumping up um, very significantly over a relatively short period of time. Um, And you know all the uncertainty about uh, the Renters Reform Act when it's coming in, what's happening with Section 21 uh, and all the other issues that have just been hammering landlords over the last five years or so. So you you talk about the different demographic of landlords. Um, You're you're absolutely right. And I think that is part of the issue because the more professional landlords with large portfolios are going to um, be full time in the sector and be able to keep up with the uh, legislation and regulation changes. The smaller landlord, you know, with maybe two or three properties, probably got a job, career, business, like a vet or a teacher or, a doctor, something like that, they don't wear a landlord hat all of the time. So they're the ones that probably will find it even more challenging to stay up to speed with everything and also to deal with these challenges and the slimming margins that landlords are experiencing. Do we we have any knowledge, and I I don't, but I wonder if there is stats out there, numbers of individual landlords versus, and numbers of owned, of the properties that they own versus numbers of properties that are owned by larger, larger landlords. Mm. Anybody know? I don't. Well, I have some figures from Homelet, yeah. which I don't know how up to date they are, but there's about 2.3 million landlords in the UK. Right. Apparently, according to these figures, um, around 97% of them have three properties or okay. less. So they are the mass landlord Gosh. market. Yeah. It's only 3% of landlords that have four or more properties. Mm. Yeah, and I think I was, that's very much reflected in the English Housing Survey as well, which mm-hmm. tends to be um, the main data set in terms of trying to dissect what private rent sector looks okay. like. Tim, it's all very well having all these regulations, and, and, and they're, they're, they're being imposed, arguably for, for good reasons, I understand, but can they be enforced? Are the government capable of doing that? Are, are there um, methods of, of, of enforcing them? There are, um, and I think there's a different picture around the country because ultimately a lot of the rules and regulations are enforced by local authorities. And some local authorities are better at doing that than others. I think the um, UK government understand that 
And if you look at their proposals for a fairer private rented sector, there is a focus in there on local authorities in terms of giving them more funding to target their enforcement, but also an interesting idea and something that PropTomart has pushed is enforcement league tables. So actually, you know, local authorities would be, would be ranked. And I think an important step of enforcement is inspections. You know, inspections lead to um, property standards being addressed and then eventually will, will lead to, to fines and enforcement. But the key is that local authorities are out there inspecting properties okay. and working with landlords, agents yeah. and tenants across the country. But as you say, some authorities are better at that than others or mm. more active in that. Yeah, and I think that's, that's you know, um, local authority budgets have been mm. cut and they've got priorities and they've got lots of, lots of priorities, so I've stretched uh, very thinly. Yeah. I also think there's an element of tenants need to be educated as well. For instance, if a landlord refuses to undertake a repair or uh, you know, a significant maintenance issue, the tenant can actually report the, the landlord to the local authority, to the local authority. Uh, and the local authority can enforce the landlord to undertake that work. And mm. some of the horror stories, I don't know if you agree, Tim, they, that, that we hear about damp and mould and, and so forth, they wouldn't arise if the tenant had gone to the local authority and said, okay. actually, this landlord isn't dealing with this problem. Can you, can you assist me in getting it rectified? That's why, I was quite, that's why I was interested in the question. So if they go to the local authority, make a complaint about their landlord, what can the local authority do? They can inspect it and say, well, what then happens? I don't know. Well, they, they can enforce it and they can get the landlord to undertake the work. And if the landlord says, I'm busy, I haven't got enough money or... Well, then well they'd, normally, the teeth. they'd normally be given an improvement notice, mm -hmm. which they'd have to respond to within a time limit. Right. If no response within that improvement notice, then they'd be looking for you know, further enforcement and a fine. Um, it sounds like a lengthy, complicated <laughs> process. Well, if you follow that process, it could lead to a banning order. If a local authority issues you know, two or more banning, for, banning orders within, I think it's 12 months or a set period of time, mm -hmm. that landlord or agent can go onto the what they call the database of rogue landlords and letting agents but that database isn't actually public it's only accessible to local authorities um, and um, the government department so what we're saying and actually have pushed for over the years is to ensure that is public it's important okay. that tenants know whether a, a landlord yeah. or an agent is on there has committed an offense but also from property market agents' point of view, um, their employers, employees, they need to vet yes. who, who potentially is operating in the market. Yeah. And I think the second point around that is, we're obviously talking about the private rent sector, but we argue, or, or our figures state, that around 70% of uh, sales agents do lettings. So of course it's important that any uh, banning orders or database of rogue landlords and property yeah. agents links up with the banning order list for sales agents because we don't want a scenario where you're banned as a letting agent in the morning, but you can operate as a sales agent in the afternoon. So that coordination from local authority all the way up to government, working with landlord, yeah. tenants and agents yeah. is, is really important. But of course, you also don't really want to be letting a property on behalf of a, a landlord that's got on that list as a rogue landlord. That's not, that's not good for business either. Yes, exactly. Yeah. exactly. I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of thinking in, in my head as you were talking, if, if I'm a tenant, in this market at the moment, which um, is very competitive, there's not a lot of choice, rents are rising, I've got myself into a property, but, there's, but, but the landlord is not looking after it and there's damp and there's you know, things going wrong. Am I really going to lodge a complaint against my landlord with the local council? Because I've immediately upset my landlord. Well, I think the first, the first thing the tenant should do, if certainly if they're, they're renting through an agent, yeah. is make that complaint got to it. the agent. And all agents should have uh, a complaints procedure in place that, that's followed. Um, there is the ability to, to as you, we've discussed, engage the local authority. Yeah. But certainly letting agents um, are all legally required to belong to what they call a redress scheme. And in order that will also allow for um, a certain level of investigation yeah. um, and, and yeah. potentially results in, in compensation. Mm -hmm. But initially, you know, they should be making that complaint to the agent, local authority is there to inspect, and there's also that sort of compensation element with the redress scheme. The That's UK government... why a property mark 
agent. Mm. Well, yes. I mean, obviously, yeah. not we, all agents are property mark. Well, not all agents yeah. are, are are property mark, but we will, as an organisation check that they are registered with a redress scheme. That's part of our yes. sort of vetting um, process. Yeah. So agents are legally required to sign up to that. There is proposals from the UK government to extend uh, the redress schemes to landlords. Now, I think, Phil, you've touched on confusion and the ability for the tenant and landlord to understand who to complain to, where do they go? And I think, from property market's point of view, um, moving and introducing landlord redress is a positive step. However, we believe that should be for all landlords who are fully managing property, because then you create a level playing field with the agent. Yes. But also, the UK government needs to create some sort of front door where the tenant can engage mm. in, in the process. Mm. The redress schemes are very much an industry uh, mm. focus on the agent being signed up mm. and then having to relay that information to the tenant. Mm. But I think we can do more in order for the tenant to understand where to go to raise issues initially. Yeah. And if it goes to a complaint, then then fair enough. We can but, always do more too. But I think, I think <laughs> Phil, it also chimes back to lack of tenant education because you mentioned a tenant being fearful to report a self-managing landlord. Yes. In, we'll use that as an example. Um, as Tim has explained, what would happen if it was a, an agent managed, managed property? Um, the tenant fearful to report the mm. landlord. They're probably fearing getting a Section 21 notice mm. for having the audacity yeah. to complain. But of course, Section 21 notices, uh, sorry, uh, you know, a retaliatory eviction is, is illegal. Mm. So t tenants cannot yeah. be evicted because they complained about a repair issue so be, they there's will be so worried. much skating underneath yeah. all of this yeah. this law um and and you know that is a, a, a great concern uh, to everybody every responsible person in yeah. our sector yeah. is concerned about that um within the property tribe membership would you say the majority use an agent or or, or manage the property themselves Again, I think um, it's hard to say because I don't think there are any statistics, are there, about how many uh, landlords use fully managed versus um, self-managing? Um, I would have thought nowadays more use, a, use an agent. But then there's this issue of margin slimming. A lot yeah, of landlords yeah. are thinking, actually, I'll... Yeah. Maybe try and do my own self-managing to save 10%, which I, I think is a complete, complete waste of... Uh, I, I don't agree with that at all. I think agents, you know, earn yeah. their commission. There's a lot of work in, in ensuring a compliance and safe tenancy. Increasing amounts of work with 100 and... What did you yeah. say? Yeah, I think agents are worth every, <laughs> yes. every penny. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I would say probably on property tribes, it's maybe, I don't know... 70, 30 in, right. in terms of self-managing, okay. but it, it's, it is hard to say. I wanted to read out a comment that, um, that a bit of feedback from the last video that we did, Vanessa, because there was loads and loads of feedback when talking about landlords, talking about whether, whether they were rogue and who, who was responsible for what. Landlords have benefited from a set of circumstances provided by the state with a very low bar for entry into the position of collecting revenues from other individuals' wages. Those circumstances are clearly changing. Time to adapt. Is a change in circumstances really so bad? Um, I, I, I totally get that. I totally get that. Are there, are there, is there an influx of rogue agents out there? I, I haven't seen it. I, I can relate to that, uh, you know, through the lens of a tenant. They might think that, but then we have to kind of roll back to what's actually caused the problem that this country is facing right now as we sit here, and that is mm. a massive shortage of rental yeah. property uh, and rents rising as a result. Yes. Um, when there's very high demand and yes. low supply, prices go up. That's the same for any, any sector, any business, any industry. So it's actually the government that have created this problem mm. um, by not providing enough social housing. So you've got local authorities that have legal obligations to house people. They don't have enough so social housing to achieve that. So they have to discharge those obligations yeah. into the private rented sector. Yeah. And we are seeing more and more, of, of we mentioned before, but it's becoming more prevalent, local authorities offering these golden welcomes to landlords saying, 
you know, there's a two and a half thousand pound um, mm. incentive to, to give us your property. So we have a total disconnect between what is going on at the coalface with local government trying to house people with waiting lists growing and growing and growing yeah. more people going into temporary accommodation which costs the taxpayer way way more mm. than housing somebody in a private sector landlord home um, and then we have cent central government um, putting in all these barriers to keep, not only keep landlords in the sector, but encourage new landlords into the sector. So that is the absolute mm. gist of the problem, in, in, in my opinion. Yeah, no, you summed it up well. I think um, there's no doubt about it. There's good and bad in all industries, all sectors, all professions. But certainly from property market engagement I have with members, there's a lot of good people trying to do good things. And I think ultimately talked about that barrier to entry from the agent point of view, all of our you know, members have voluntarily signed up to be regulated, to get themselves qualified and trained and stay on top of the ever-changing uh, legislative um, landscape. So there is an absence of uh, barriers to entry, yeah. but there is a model through professional bodies, Yes and what other agents are doing in, in, to, in order to get themselves qualified, which is raising standards in the absence yeah. of that overarching um, regulation um, from, from yeah. the government. It's a real mixed bag, isn't it? it it's, there's so much involved. There are so many moving parts, so many variables, mm. and they all seem to be moving the wrong way at the moment. I'm, mm. I'm very worried about what this means for society further down the track. Mm. If the private rented sector isn't isn't attractive mm -hmm. you know we we need it we absolutely society needs the private rented sector because as you say vanessa a lot of the state-owned housing yeah. system has been sold. and i think narrative and the way that politicians and government talk about the sector is important mm -hmm. certainly when i'm talking to civil servants and politicians very much talking about landlords agents the private rented sector being a key housing provider yeah. you know it's the second largest tenure now outside yes. of homeowners. Therefore, to some extent, it needs to be nurtured. It needs to have a strategy that allows it to um, grow and actually meet the needs and the demands of, of tenants and people in, in is society. Is it being nurtured or has the pendulum swung too far? I think it's swung too far. Mm, is that right? um, and it's gonna reach a certain point and then there's going to be some wake-up calls happening, yeah. hopefully, and it's going to start swinging back the mm. other way. And I think the, the, the other point to make is that, I suppose, unintended consequences of all legislation, but also be careful what you wish for. I think we certainly saw throughout uh, the pandemic, and we are continuing to see that landlords move to short-term lets, mm. where there's even less regulation yes, very true. and Airbnb, prepare to put up perhaps with longer void periods, but the returns over those shorter periods can be more, you know, um, can be better than what they perhaps get over the long term in the private rented sector. So that has to form part of the government strategy going forward. What do they want the private rented sector to look like and what part does it need to play in housing and homing people, you know, across the country? Mm. So are we saying between the three of us that we, we suspect things are going to get worse before they're going to get better? Because there's going to be less people involved, there's going to be less landlords in the private rented sector because they're going to sell up. They are selling up. Mm. And if they sell up, rents rise, that's bad news for tenants. And it's only then that somebody mm. in government might wake up and... and well, let's not forget possessions repossessions which are on the rise for landlords because of yeah. the um, the bank rate jumping up uh, which has affected landlords that are on standard variable rates and tracker mm. rates um, this is having an impact on landlords because many of them kept their rents low yeah. because a lot of landlords that I speak to and I'm one of them myself we tend to keep the rent um, at the level throughout the tenancy and only think about doing a rental increase if it's appropriate and the market rent will will you know support that at the end of a tenancy so um, there's a lot of landlords that have had very long-term good stable tenants um, now they're on SVR their, their rate has jump, jumped up probably yeah. significantly more than the rent that they are receiving but they can't remortgage because that rent is so low yeah. and I'll give an example from my own experience we're sitting here in Basingstoke I have a four-bed house down the road I've had tenants in there for about five years and they've been paying £1,100 a month and 
maybe more fool me, I haven't increased it. I found out recently that the going rate is 1750 a month. But when I went to re do a remortgage, because that property is on a tracker rate, yeah. um, the 1100 pounds a month did not support the existing borrowing I had. Yeah. So I would have had to input it about 30,000 pounds to redeem that tracker mortgage. So I was just looking for a like for like remortgage. Yeah. Um, so what's the yeah. answer? Put the rent up, yes. which I didn't particularly want to do, or ask those tenants to leave and yeah. find a tenant that will pay 1750. Yeah. Really so, tricky, and, and people will look at you and go, you know, there'll be a lot of finger wagging, rogue landlord hiking rents, but actually, you've got a mortgage to support. And, and I've kept it way below market yeah. rate for, for five years. And if they want to move, yeah. they are not going to find another property in Basingstoke at £1,100 a month. Mm. So they are going to have to go it's to a, a, it's a higher a real rate. Mess. We have got ourselves in a real pickle. Mm. Well, I think. There will always be legislative change in the private rent sector. You know, the trend of what we've seen over the last couple of years proves that. But making announcements, delivering policy papers from the UK government, that all creates uncertainty. So I think until that legislation um, comes and they deliver it, there is uncertainly, uncertainty in the market. And as we know, certainly the agents I speak to around landlords, I think the missing bit that sort of sits behind um, the investment is sentiment. You know, sentiment I think is is important as well for how people will or landlords will stay in, yes. stay out. So those messages yes. coming from government is is vitally important. But I think what um, Vanessa was alluded to, of course, to everyone's struggling through the cost of living. Property market recognises that, and, and tenants are struggling as well. However, as a he, as a key housing provider, you know, landlords. Are potentially struggling as well. They've got costs and overheads that needs to form part of that conversation. Just briefly touching on rent and rent levels, away from the UK government, if you look at all the other devolved nations, they have looked and are looking at rent control or, mm -hmm. or rent caps. Northern Ireland have looked at it through uh, the Private Tenancies Act, did a report, the report came back and said no further action apart from being able to raise the rent once every 12 months. Wales are looking at it and property marks on a government working group there where they kind of looking at different scenarios around what should fair rents look like. But in Scotland, through their cost of living legislation, they've actually introduced a rent cap, you know, and that... Um, and there's been a landlord exodus. <laughs> yeah, and that certainly had a knock-on effect in terms of those uh, institutional investors looking at the long term of... Uh, of, of investing in Scotland, but also, you know, more landlords of one or two properties where rent was never really an issue. But now they're having to look at their mortgage costs, look at their overhead mm -hmm. and see how does that fit with what the Scottish government might do in 12, 15, 18 months time. Yeah, I mean, you said the word uncertainty there. That that for me is, is what really does make life difficult for landlords. That. Mm that uncertainty. Landlords mm. have to really think very long term mm. with buy to let as an investment. As you know, you're thinking 15, 20 yeah. years. How can you plan for anything where everything's just changing all the time and, yeah. you know, legislation that was supposed to come in in 2025 yes. yeah. gets pushed we'll get, back we'll to 2028. To the, yeah, for my discussion. The same. Yeah. There's uncertainty for tenants as well. Because of there's when there's uncertainty for landlords, yep. shall I sell, shall I put the rent up or not, yep. creates uncertainty for It, it does, definitely. Yeah. Do either of you feel that the changes in tax rules that the revenue have, have put on landlords, w do you think they were designed to reduce the numbers of landlords? Did they want people to leave the, the, the landlord owning sector? 100% in yeah. my opinion, yeah. But in so doing, I guess the idea was to help potential first time buyers because landlords would sell up, first time buyers would buy them. Has that actually happened? Well, I think governments are very much talk about home ownership and in particular, we've had a Conservative government uh, for over 10 years, so they're very much keen for home owners. Yes. But I think ultimately you can talk about that. You can talk about house building targets, which has been in the political news over the years. But unless there's a plan to actually deliver and build those homes, the private rental sector will continue to 
be needed. And I think even yes. in the cost of living uh, situation, people are struggling. They'll be struggling to save more in terms of deposit and move onto the, the housing ladder. And therefore, the private rental sector has that vitally important role to yeah, play. It feels but, like it's needed even more now. Well, it is because new builds are down in number as well. Yeah. Because developers are facing cost so of living. So new builds are down in number. We're, yeah. we're not building enough to start with. Yeah. Um, and it's ever harder for first-time buyers to get onto the ladder, which well, means it, it is, they and go also, back to the private rent sector. Know, yeah. Their mortgages are going up as well because the rates of, of residential yeah. mortgages have gone up. So, uh, yeah, it's it, it, it just really is this serious it's a mess. muddle. It's a um, mess. Well, but I think fundamentally, you know, governments of all colours need to build more houses, and they need to link those targets to different tenures and then they need to analyze what's needed yeah. and what's the demand in local areas mm -hmm. be that by rent property property to buy then you're into conversations around two beds three beds four beds mm. what's the demographic mm. in that area so fundamentally we need more homes yeah. built but it's got to be linked to what people need and, yes. and the demand yeah, we need and, and where they need them as well yes. the areas we've got yeah. to build what we need where we need it exactly and that hasn't always happened so we need, the private rented sector needs to be very diverse it does because there are people that legitimately um, don't want to buy their own home I, yeah. i've got an actual friend of mine who is extremely wealthy he doesn't for whatever reason, want to own his own home, and he rents a very luxurious five-bed mm. barn conversion. Yeah. There's the widest choice in the private rented sector, from you know a humble one-bed apartment right up to to luxury homes that yes. people have the desire to rent. People coming yes. from abroad, working in uh, you know as executives yeah. in big corporations, yeah. they want to be able to access you know good quality family home that they can afford to pay the, for it. But they're only going to be able to do that if, if, if it is attractive to own that home and to put it into the private rented sector. And, and whilst I totally endorse and support getting rid of rogue landlords and, and having the, the kind of framework to manage mm. it properly and make sure that tenants are looked after mm. and the place is looked after, actually it does feel like the pendulum of, of, of mm. tax. And I want to talk to you both about the EPC rules because that's coming down the track mm. and that's, a, that's going to be another obstacle. Yes, in theory, I like it, it's a good idea, but mm. um, in practice, what's it going to mean? But I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, let's just talk about EPC and what's come down the track because it seems well, to be a changing face mm, as well. Yeah. yeah, well, I think there's there's no doubt about it. You know, um, climate change is a is a real issue, and I think um, property mark recognise that. And I think the um, climate change committee say that roughly forty percent of UK emissions come from households. Mm. So you know there is a, a an issue there that needs to be resolved. Yeah. I think the government need to be careful with um, standalone targets that are one size fits all. As we've just discussed, there's a whole range of different property types and buildings in the UK. Yeah. And essentially saying that to rent out a property, everything has to be uh, an EPC C, yeah. which yeah. is the of, proposal of C above. from, yes, minimum yeah. um, by 2025 for new tenancies will be a challenge, will be a huge challenge in certain parts of the country. Those proposals are set out in uh, a strategy document from the UK government. We haven't actually seen any legislation yet. Um, there is legislation going through Westminster at the moment, which is looking at retaining the EPCC date, but pushing um, the 25, um, 2025 date back to 2028. So, so you get more uncertainty. Mm. But creates more uncertainty, but if there is, um, which we're pushing for incentives, you know, information, communication, and sort of grant funding that I think for landlords uh, and homeowners to tap into, then I think people will start to engage in the process. For example, the UK government has a, a boiler upgrade scheme. Well, when we surveyed our men members, nearly half of Property mark members hadn't heard, hadn't of, it. heard of it, so that's yeah. you know a prime um, e e example. We got, we got lots of comments um, from landlords actually on on, the, on our last video talking about the, the EPC and and it being a major reason for them selling up. Mm. Um, well, Phil, we can actually begin to join up the dots now because mm. if um, a, a landlord 
uh, wants to make these energy efficiency upgrades, I think it's typically between 10 and 15,000 to do. That's, that's what I've heard from the Property Tribes community. Okay. And also I've been speaking to some energy experts as well. Typically a landlord would go to remortgage to get those funds to make the upgrades. Yeah. But as we said earlier, a lot of them won't be able to remortgage because of the stress tests, the interest rate rises and so on. Yeah. So I personally know of several landlords that have got portfolios around the DEF uh, yeah. ranking yeah. and and they don't know where they're going to get the money mm. from to to do these upgrades and they're thinking of selling yeah. but now it's been pushed back to 2028 20, uh, potentially, you know, potentially. Yeah. so or 20 whatever yeah, i've got an um, example of a yeah. comment that i pulled out the requirement for epcc or better is going to be a catastrophe for the private rental market and the renters i don't know why anyone would buy a flat d or worse at the moment as their value is very vulnerable uh, well, flats are leasehold, so then that has to go into the devil is in the detail because yeah. is the leaseholder going to be responsible for the energy upgrades when their lease prohibits them doing a lot of activities within, yeah. uh, within the property? So again, this is a question I've asked. Will the, uh, the leaseholder uh, be responsible for energy upgrades yeah. or will it be the freeholder? That's and the actually, answer. nobody can answer that question. As a building as a whole. Because, yeah, because yeah. obviously, you know, if you want to go and change windows in a leasehold flat to improve the energy efficiency, I think the freeholder might have something to say about that. Well, but what we've been trying to do at, at Property Mark is uh, work with the agents and engage them to, to engage their landlords. I think, um, yes, there is uncertainty. However, there will be targets. The dates, potentially the, the banding will move. Yes. But this is a key issue uh, for all governments across the UK, therefore the legislation will come. So we've been saying to our agents, sit down with your landlords now, work out what does their portfolio look like in five, 10, 15 years? Are there other renovation planned at those property where energy efficiency improvements can, yeah, be, can made? be made? Have all the quick wins in order yeah. to improve um, those things on the, an EPC being made in order to start to think about that process. Now, there are bits of funding around from local authorities, certainly. Um, and the funding is available now, is it? Some of the schemes, um, have, I think, ran out at the end of, of March, but there are various schemes across the UK um, that allow for the you know energy efficiency upgrades. If perhaps tenants are on benefits as well, you can work with um, the energy providers as well have certain schemes. So it's about analysing what property do you have, what the tenants renting there and looking at all the, the funding mechanism that's available. Because unfortunately, as Vanessa has alluded to, you know, the average cost 10 to 15,000 mm. pounds. But I think the UK government's last green homes grant was only up to 5,000 mm. pounds. So, And we started this chat saying 97% of landlords have three or less properties. They're not mm. going to have 10 or 15 grand no. of cash kicking around. They might have it in equity, but as mm -hmm. you say, Vanessa, they're not going to be able it. to access that mm -hmm. equity unless they put the rents up. <laughs> so, again... Yeah, we, well, you know, we're getting down to the nitty gritty <laughs> now, aren't we? Um, it's, it's not looking pretty, and I guess because there's uncertainty, as Tim, you, you've said a, a few times, changes in legislation, they don't happen overnight, but they need to be discussed. And, and I, I feel that now is our opportunity to discuss it and throw it up and, and, and see what kind of sticks. But there's a lot of variables. And maybe this, I have no experience in how legislation gets built, but it, I'm assuming, I'm hoping, they put it out there, thinking this sounds like a good idea, let's see what happens. Let's the industry discuss it. And then hopefully they make some, some good decisions, some decisions based on, on knowledge and expertise from the kind of, from the coalface at the end of the day, but at the moment it just feels really messy and pretty. Mm -hmm. I, I want to read out another landlord sentiment um, that we got feedback on, on, on the, the last video that I did. I've been a landlord for over 20 years. I've sold every property with a mortgage because of the tax penalties that have come in. Mm -hmm. I have three left mortgage free, which will be sold if and when tenants give notice. The government clearly don't want private landlords, so I will give them what they want and they can deal with the housing shortage. That kind of sentiment, I understand it, but it's very, very troubling. Mm -hmm. Long term, that is really troubling because we're simply, we're going to run out. We're going to run out of accommodation. Mm -hmm. Well, you can see it. I can see it. 
Tim can see it. <laughs> uh, government can't see it. Um, I, I mean, I would imagine that a lot of uh, older landlords or more mature landlords in terms of where they are in their, in their portfolio business, building um, career, mm. they probably thinking, well, I was going to exit in five years time, but actually, no, I'm going now. Yeah. And to be honest, I'm probably in that category. I'm on the cusp of thinking, actually, I've had enough. Um, and, you know, it's very challenging out there. Mm. Um, and, you know, I, <clears throat> the two mortgages I have left on SVRs are, are punishing. I mm. won't deny it. Um, and I'm struggling to, you know, well, not struggling, but I'm, you know, carrying on with those, trying to find solutions for them. I've put one of them on the market. Okay. Um, and I'm not sure what I'll do with the other one. But, um, yeah, it, 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 it really is coming down to the nitty gritty mm. now that uh, people are making these decisions to, to exit and the supply is going to get less. Can I ask, Vanessa, um, obviously there's different, there's different methods of return as an investor. Mm. There is your yield that you collect off the rent and then mm. the chance of capital growth. Mm -hmm. of, of, of you as an investor, where's your interest been? More yield or more capital growth? Well, every investor should really focus on yield um, because if you don't have yield, you may not yeah. survive long enough to benefit from capital uh -huh. growth. Uh, the um, reason so for my I've question focused on that, yes, <clears throat> is no one's really expecting much capital growth down the track. It's certainly not in the, in, in the mm. short term. So if you're not getting yield and you're not getting capital growth, well, that will you're deter out. those landlords that do have very uh, significant other income from a business or their yeah. career or whatever, and we're just doing it. You know, for the capital growth, they weren't. They they used to be this saying it washed its own face. So that meant that the rent covered the mortgage. A lot of people who had uh, other significant income were quite happy to have those, you know, on the back burner, just yeah. going up in value over over yeah. the years, and they were going to cash in the equity, or you know, whatever it might be, legacy for their children or pension hedge or whatever. But you, you're right. There's no um, yields are going down. Capital growth. Well, it looks like we're starting to lose all the gains we've made over the last two or three years. Yeah. Um, it's becoming far less attractive, isn't it? Mm. Are the institutional investors coming in? I mean, aside from build to rent, which is different, but do you think we'll get to that stage where, 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 like we see in Europe, where the pension companies and what have you buying up loads and loads of property? Anybody well, we are, we are seeing that, aren't we? And Lloyds Bank has um, stated that they're going to become a landlord. Okay. Um, I think with, other with, banks are available. Yeah, with other banks. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we've seen um, a, an increase in, in, in bill to rent. Yes. Uh, um, but it's nowhere near um, no. filling the void that's, that's there for the, for the amount of supply that's mm. needed. And again, it's very often these luxury kind of chrome and glass flats, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and I think it goes back to what we were talking about at the start. What's the overall vision from government for landlords, tenants, agents, the private rented sector? Because I think, um, you know, there's other country examples where Germany is often yes. muted, where mm. you have a higher proportion yeah. of the population uh, renting. But over there, of course, you've got a smaller pool of providers. Mm. So again, it goes back to that conversation. Do you want does the government want a smaller, more professional, perhaps private rented sector that's just centered around interested investors? Yeah. Or do they now need to support actually mm. the bulk of oh, the key home providers, housing providers in the UK, which is your landlords with mm. one to three properties? So it comes back to that long term. What's your sense? Who do you think they want to attract? Who do they want to look after? I don't think they know. I really don't. I think more uncertainty. Yeah, I think um, yeah, definitely from from the current government want to see more homeowners, and I think we've they've tried that through the first home scheme, uh, even the stamp duty holiday. Yes. you know, throughout the the pandemic. So I think they they recognise the value in home ownership. I think the private rented sector, as Vanessa's alluded to, you only need to look at. The tax changes, the lack of coordination in terms of the energy efficiency and the housing legislation they're proposing. I don't think they're quite sure what to do with the private rent sector. But if we were to get a change of government yes. and we talk to uh, politicians of all sides, um, I think they're certainly more interested in a smaller, more professional yeah. private rent sector, which could mean licensing of letting agents and more 
registration and training requirements yeah, are, are on landlords. Yeah, Labour's policies are even more draconian than the Conservatives. We've got a thread on property tribes saying, watch out for a Labour government. If they're in, I'm out kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, that's more uncertainty because if we get a Labour government, they are even less landlord friendly. How, than how do you think things might change with a with different government? Well, they're talking about rent controls um, and more licensing and other other things that's going to make it even harder for landlords to really have any kind of margin in their business. So, mm. uh, yeah, it's uh, it is very so, difficult. So, where does that leave? Where does that leave things in terms of properties that could be available for rent when there is increasing demand from the rental sector? Where's this going to end? Well, I think just going back on the potential change in colour on uh, the government, I mean, yes, totally agree. I think if there was a change uh, to a Labour government, there would be certainly um, a greater focus on, on tenants through sort of landlord charters and the rights and roles and responsibilities of what uh, landlords need to do. But I also think they have said publicly that they would build more social and council housing. So I think that is positive based on some of the things we were saying earlier. But ultimately, you know, would some of those properties just sit empty? Does private rented sector property get bought by homeowners? Sometimes they've, you know, they're kind of the different type of property that people are after. Um, so I think it again goes back to what's the overall vision for housing in the country going forward. Maybe we're just in, in a kind of state of flux at the moment because we've got an election on the horizon. No one's going to make any big changes. There is a lot of uncertainty. Nobody really wants to tidy that up yet because they don't know who's going to be doing responsible for what. But meanwhile, life goes on. And if, if there's a change of government and, and, and if they decide to build more, well, that's five years down the track Quite. by the time that comes. Yeah. Where's everyone going to live? You know, we've got blood on the streets out there at the moment with, with people that haven't, can't find the housing, people yeah. who can't afford the housing. Mm. Well, obviously, I'm sorry to say that homelessness mm. may rise. I mean, I've got a very simple solution Go which it, I would like to fantastic. put forward. I think that um, <clears throat> the, the biggest problems in the sector are caused by um, self-managing landlords who either don't understand uh, the rules and regulations or they're a rogue or should we say criminal landlord who is there with the intent to um, make, yeah. make not, not to provide safe and compliant homes. If all landlords were forced to let through an accredited agent, yeah. uh, such as the Property Mark um, agents mm. who have, as Tim said, currently voluntarily subscribe to professional standards, if that was made a mandatory thing, I think it would reduce the incidence of um, tenants being badly affected by, by yeah. rogue landlords because essentially good quality reputable agents act as gatekeepers. Yeah. So they protect the landlord because they can spot a potential rogue tenant through yeah. robust tenant referencing. Yes. Um, but they also protect the tenants from, from rogue landlords. So, um, the, you know, I, I want to see that, that tenants and landlords are protected from rogues because yep. there are rogue landlords and there are rogue Absolutely. tenants. Um, there was a big thing in the paper today about a um, tenant that had done t tens of thousands of pounds of damage to, to a rental property and the landlord didn't know how he was going to afford yeah. to get it back up to a lettable standard. Mm. So that's another property off the mm. table to rent mm. because he can't afford to get it uh, yeah. refurbished. So um, th th there's some fairly simple and quick solutions that could uh, help stop the, the problems that we're seeing. Um, I don't know, would you, I think you like that idea, I hope. <laughs> yeah, I mean, totally. I think, you know, Property Mark, you know, advocates for higher standards. And, and I think our argument is, um, you know, all letting agents should be qualified, trained, and, and, and maintain that on an ongoing basis. And therefore you give the landlord um, the choice use a qualified regulated agent yeah. or do it yourself. Mm -hmm. And certainly in Scotland, where they've introduced uh, a letting agent registration and qualifications for letting agents, there was a study done at the start of this year, which actually said nearly 90% of agents who had taken the qualification felt more 
professional, felt more competent in their work. And over, you know, 50%, over half of the landlords surveyed said they felt that standards in the private rent sector had improved. So qualification on its own isn't one thing, but it would at least allow a minimum entry requirement and then that qualification the training the role of professional bodies needs to continue to interact with as we've discussed local authorities the redress schemes and government to drive up things going forward Mm. but i think what hopefully consumers will beginning to see landlords and tenants uh, more information on the property portals there's been a project yes. Um, yes. on the material information, which is yeah. the technical term under yeah. the, the, the legislation that the agent must uh, provide um, to the consumer. So they're now playing that role in terms of ensuring that when the tenant and the landlord goes to that property, um, home buyers and sellers as well, all the information is in, in one place. So we're beginning you know, to corner, corner off um, those bad but we're kind of we're getting there. We are. It feels like in a in a state of flux, and there is a lot of uncertainty mm-hmm. around. There are good tenants. There are bad tenants. There are good landlords mm-hmm. and bad landlords. But and there the are good agents one, and bad agents. The bad ones are in the minority, though. I think. Yes, Phil. but they make but they make the noise. loudest yes. noise. Yeah. Um, I, I guess at the end of the day, it's after everybody to look after themselves. And, and 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 do things properly themselves by understanding their responsibilities. Well, there's lots of people interacting with the letting and renting process. And I think, therefore, whether it's um, when you're purchasing a buy-to-let property, the lenders have a part to play in terms of the, the survey and the, mm-hmm. the property standards of, 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 of the building. The landlord um, you know, has a responsibility to ensure that that property is fit to be let yeah. out if they're interacting with an agent. The agent then has a responsibility to guide yeah. you know, and manage that on an ongoing basis. But the tenant as well, as we've discussed, um, has an important role in order to raise issues, have good yeah. communication, mm-hmm. understand their rights and responsibilities, mm-hmm. and then the local authorities. Um, so everybody's well. pushing in the same direction. Mm-hmm. The, everybody. The, the, the tenant wants somewhere nice to live and is happy to pay rent for that. The landlord wants a nice tenant, collect the rent, provide the property in, in a decent state of repair. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is up to everybody involved to do their bit. Mm. I would, and, I think that's a very good summary, yes. We also had some feedback um, from some tenants, of course, uh, and one of them wrote, it's nonsense to say that fewer rental properties is a disaster. If landlords sell up, those houses don't disappear into thin air. They become available for renters to buy. Rent must cost more than a mortgage, or why did banks provide buy-to-let mortgages for people who wanted to get rich by doing nothing? Any thoughts on that? Mm. I mean, it's, it's a fair point. Houses don't disappear into thin air. Well, I think the, the, the first point is that we shouldn't just think of the housing market as one housing market. It's made up of different markets and submarkets across the country. So depending on where you're renting, there may be less or more demand. But certainly the feedback we've had from agents in the majority uh, of places across the country is that there's, you know, 50 to 100 applicants you know, when property in yeah. cities goes up for rent. So I think we need to be cautious about that. There, d- there needs to be supply because we are seeing, you know, ongoing uh, demand. I think the debate about whether that property then can be bought by um, renters, I think, mm-hmm. is a legitimate one and that probably will happen. But again, in the cost of living situation, yeah. people, you know, are still going to be required to have those ongoing costs when they bought the property yeah. and have the deposit to buy in the first place. That's what I was going to say. The chances are the chances are, the person who might like to buy that property is currently a tenant with rising rents and therefore going to struggle to save the deposit. Mm. But it's, it's not just the deposit. Uh, it's got, you've got to have the financial position in order to qualify for a residential mortgage as well. Um, a lot of people don't want the responsibility of owning a home or mm. they are yeah. you know, moving around on contract work or yeah. something of that nature. Private rented is very uh, attractive because the landlord is responsible for yep. all the repairs and maintenance, which can be quite significant. Mm. You know, if you have a boiler go wrong and need to be replaced, you're yeah. talking maybe two and a half, three thousand mm. pounds in some instances. So people 
want to rent and have many reasons for doing so. They don't necessarily want to buy. Mm. Um, so there's always this, you know, flux of properties coming in on and off the market. Um, and I, I don't, I can understand why people might think that if a landlord sells up, it, it gives the opportunity for somebody else to buy. But there's plenty of properties out there to buy mm. anyway. Mm. And tenants, um, uh, and many tenants are still preferring to to stay in the uh, the private mm. rental sector. So listen, always great to talk to you both. <laughs> it's such a there's such a hot debate, and it's a really it's a really important one to have right at this moment. So thank you both for joining, and much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.